welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with Dr. Amin, who is about to run down the Epistle of Yoida, and and that's Jude in English. And uh, yeah, let's, let's just do it, jump right into it. Do, by the way, Dr. One has a channel, links in the description, and uh, click on the channel and subscribe. But let's get right into the text, man. What's going on? Yeah, let's let's jump right into it, shall we? Thanks, by the way, to everybody for coming. And I wanted to make this short and to the point, so we're going to do 30 minutes. Yeah. And you guys will have a chance to ask your questions as if you were an engaged group uh, audience. Um, this will be like a huge classroom. Yeah, so submit, submit super chats. Those come first. But if you just have a question and I see it, I'll be able to ask it. But we're going to wait until he's done, though. He's, gonna get, he's got a 30-minute presentation. And submit your questions as you're go, as he's going along, and we'll get to them. Okay. So I, want, I wanted you guys to be able to take a look at a typical letter. This is Jude, who is the one who opens the apocalypse, baby. He's the first act. You know, the one they bring on the stage to get the audience's interest. This is Jude. He's sitting right in front of the apocalypse and he says some strange things that in the Greek are beautifully Gnostic. And uh, I think that you would enjoy them very much. And so I want to take you to the actual Greek itself. And I just want to, I'm going to throw some Greek at you and I'm going to just kind of translate along. Um, and my goal is to look, I mean, between us, my goal is to initiate you so that you can be born again and feel that antiquity that was the mystery. So, and hopefully, um, you know, after all of that, with the angels get out and whatnot, it's a good time. Good time is had by all. All right. What am I talking about? Trying to take you back to the time and the place to get you into the primary source so that you feel what the ancient uh, celebrant felt, what the one who had been initiated and born again felt. And I'm going to do that through the language so that you will have ears to hear. Okay. So let's start with Jude. And uh, I can see that Neil already has that up. So um, I'm just going to read a little bit to you. I'm going to throw it to you in the Greek. Judas, Jesu Christu, doulos. This is a common letter, guys. Common letter, right? So we're going to have a greeting at the beginning, um, an identification. It's usually I'm so-and-so, and I'm writing this to so-and-so. Um, and then we're going to have the body of the letter, and then we're going to have some kind of salutation at the end of this. This is pretty typical ancient letter writing. It's not remarkable. Um, it, but it says who it's from. It's from Jude, right? Now, what's curious <clears throat> and a little bit tasteful is how he identifies himself. Doulos, I am the servant. I am the slave. He identifies himself as a slave. Usually you see in these letters, son of so-and-so. Some kind of like family relationship. So hit number one, there's your, um, your ears begin to open now. Okay, um, who who is he uh, on earth? Adelphos de Jacob, right? He's that brother of Jacob, right? And now we get this date of. Um, just a little tactical difficulties there. So hopefully he's gonna be right back. Called. There we go. To, to those who have been summoned. To those who are now the chosen, right? This is a group. This is a group in antiquity. You are you're 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 moving into the mystery religion, uh, little a cult. Things should start to smell like a cult a little bit. Sure enough, languages. And then we get a verse two is just a common greeting. You know, hey, you know, uh, mercy, mercy upon you. You know what I mean? And peace and love, right? Let them be. Let them be doubled, right? This is the word for plural. Let them be pluralized, baby, right? So it's a nice greeting. Now he's going to address his audience. Agapetoi. 
those who are those who are the beloved yeah those who are the beloved we meet together for our agapetic meetings right okay so uh, look he says look i'm i've been busting butt to get to write this stuff to you um concerning the koine soteria the common salvation and soteria is not a new word it's been around for hundreds of years and it's associated with the mystery religion's central figure it's used originally in the oldest text i found at least um of a woman and she happens to be night um great stuff oh you're gonna love this it, trust me it gets a lot it, hang on hold on so he says hey um beloved those of you love i've uh, you know i've been working to get this thing to you about the common salvation because i had a real need to write to you you know trying to get you to jump into the struggle right into the into the argon contest right what the heck what okay what some kind of contest they're having right right contest for what a contest for the faith transmitted to the holy so yeah okay wow that doesn't pep you up nothing more you know what i mean um why why does he have to write to you because there's these creeps who have snuck in he says right without people having seen them they just kind of snuckered in and these guys were written about hoy palai progegamenoi these are the dudes that were written about uh with respect to what jude what they write on estuto to crima that's uh that's one verse four estuto to crima concerning their judgment what kind of people are these asebes these are people without saba and if you hold in the audience if you hold a day sacred you are keeping your sabbath you know what i mean you evangelicals and you ex-evangelicals do you know what i mean that saba comes from the greek word for to reverence or recognize right is that nice so um yeah uh we have to fight for this thing that's being handed down right and these guys have snuck in and they're not really reverent right they're impious what do these impious guys do metatithentes they've exchanged charita the the grace they've exchanged the grace for what es aselgeon what does aselges mean it means wanton license sexual violence violence and idolatry wait what right idolatry so associated with the mystery itself is aselge it's a purgation so when they bring you into the room and start whipping you that's part of the process of you being able to enter into that death state and to be resurrected now let's see does what is jude what's jude want to tell us what do they do they exchange the grace for what they aselge and arnumenai they're denying they're denying what ton monon despote they're denying what jesus christ is the one despot and kurion and lord they're not saying he's not the lord right and ruler they're saying that he's not just the one that there are multiples well that's odd it's it's kind of fits right in with the ancient cult but it's what do we do with it right well let's see what jude tells us we can do with it because there's precedent to this there's reasons they're doing this get yourself into their shoes right get yourself into their sandals um yeah and uh yeah verse five yeah he says i i want to bring it to your minds you know how it was back when the curio saved you out of the desert you know what i mean and the second time 
the people turned against him. He then he was like, "No, Apollo me, <laughs> I destroy. I am the destroyer. I am Apollo one, right? Why? Because they took out that calf, all right? And they were in the desert with all the snakes and the yeah. Okay, it goes back to Noah and oversexed giants." Let's go there. Let's go there. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, n- verse nine. Yeah. Once these people were saved, but then he crushed them. Yeah. Oh, and six. And the angels, here they are. The finally they show up. The angels. Why? What kind of, what kind of angels? The kind of angels that didn't keep their original cosmos, their order. They didn't keep their original essence. Um, you can translate this as oikos, right? They're not keeping their oikos. What is your oikos? That's how your estate. Imagine you had an estate and you had organized labor within that estate. Your oikos is that organization keeps that going. So um, is, isn't this gorgeous? They left that. Why did they leave that? Pray tell. Yeah. Um, and, and why did they leave their arcane behind? That arcane, by the way, the German philologists in the 1930s were top, 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 top. And that arche, that arche is the Reich. Okay. In the beginning was the arche, the Reich. <laughs> okay. I'm just bringing it across. Don't blame me, what they did with the mystery, but identify the mystery. So, um, yeah, here they are in verse 6, those angels, they left this estate, right? And leaving behind their own organization, right? They they, um, have been set in chains, right? These desmois, right? Hupozophon, under the darkness, under the zophon, it's not even, it's not even like darkness. It's like the film of it. Love it. This guy has some talent, right? Who else has done this? Verse seven. Hosodoma, kai gamora, kai hive. Uh, by the way, here, um, Neil, if you don't have this, maybe you don't have this scroll down that far. But I'm just, I'm just gonna keep reading it to you. And if, if you need me to screen share it, I will. Um, Because verse 7 is big. This is the dirty part. This is the dirty part. Is everybody ready for the dirty part? Neil, I need to screen share this with you, bro. They can see it. You just took it down. Yeah, I know because I had to move it. Oh, verse 7 was on the screen. Was it? Okay. Yeah, it was on the screen. Here. How's that? Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, good. See you. See you first time. Yeah, you're good. Go ahead. It's a grumpy day today for me. Okay. No, you're, fine. you're fine, man. You're good. Hoss Sodoma, right? You, you just you just gonna speak up because we're talking about Sodom now, right? Verse seven. Sodom, just like Sodom and Gomorrah brought and the cities around them, right? What did these guys do? The ek porneo sasai. Oh, what is that ek porneo? If you look it up in your Oxford. Uh, uh, lexicon, you'll find that porneo means to either fornicate, fornicate to hang around the arches, you know what I mean? Or to perform idolatrous acts. Okay. We don't have a word for this, but it's a word to be sexual in a the context of a religious rite. Yeah, so to ek porneo, you know, the ek on the front is just an intensifier. It's completely out of the closet. This is, right? Wow. So that's what Sodom and Gomorrah do. Everybody knows what happens to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Look, but wait a minute. What happens to these angels? Where do these angels go? They went after strange flesh. Strange flesh. Have you ever had strange flesh? A 
apparently it turns you into an example of ionic fire ionic fire you remember when jesus said if you do this you'll have eternal life he didn't actually say that no he didn't what did he say he said you'll have ionic life right well this is the fire of that life yeah the other flesh turn these guys to justice you know how you get rid of these guys once they've infiltrated your cult i'm gonna get this off now once they've infiltrated your cult the only way <laughs> the only way to get them out is to deliver them over to satan what <laughs> yeah yeah this kind of problem when you've got angels coming into women and producing giants is can only be rooted out one way there is no right there mercy is for the brothers okay um let me finish here uh we only have a couple of minutes i don't want to extend this um because i know i appreciate everybody's time yeah right so what did they do verse eight so this is why you know they're they're soiling their flesh baby right they're soiling it and they're denying the lordship of jesus right and they're they're casting aspersions at the doxas the glories these are living beings right ho de michael michael uh yeah you know michael you know who is michael he's an archangel bro right he's the angelos of the arche he's a reich angel nonus the, there's a famous translation of nonus for the Loeb classical series and that thing has to translate this is um into german <laughs> it's kind of funny um but it's like if you don't know philosophical german how do you know what this thing means right so go back to the greek the greek is always the best place look you get the real stuff here okay so what did michael do remember michael and the devil had this argument about moses's body right and even then michael didn't dare to bring an accusation against him right right but he said epitimesai soi kurios yeah let the kurios yeah let him bring the justice right let him cast the charges oh nice uh verse 10 yeah these are the kind of guys that blaspheme blaspheme that cast charges about things that they don't even know brah that they know them according to all their physics like what like those alogozoa now for those of you with ears to hear you'll immediately kick into the mode please put your seats in their upright position right put your belts across your lap you know we're about to take off and here's the signal that you've gotten the zodiac the living things the ion right okay so those of you who've been initiated will know this stuff and everybody else will be looking at each other like what okay so um let's get deeper into it deeper into it look so they know these things from their physics you know and they corrupt themselves in these things and you know these are the ones that you know follow the way of cain look at this it, uh, um uh to cain e son they follow the way of cain i am the way the way the road is a cult term when you are performing magic you are using the way right there's an a way called the way of cain the way of cain yeah okay i told you there's saviors and everything it's good stuff i told you okay so um and what are they doing they're they're following the wandering of 
Balaam. And that word wandering, plane, it's there for a reason because he calls him in a couple of lines. He says, you know what you guys are? You're asteres planetai. Asteres planeta. So for those who don't have ears, we hear one thing. Stars wandering. Star, excuse me for that. Stars wandering. Yeah. Stars wandering. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hois, hosophos. Oh. Hey, your screen's not sharing anymore. Uh. Well, that's okay. I'll, let me just finish off reading, okay. for the folks, because um, we're all, we're almost done. We're almost done. We have five more minutes to get through this letter, right? Okay. 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 So, um, I told Neil, I bind you. I bind you. You may not speak. You must be silent, right? Okay. So anyway, um, they're also following the the ways of this guy Balam, who's a known diviner, right? So, oh, good. I know exactly what area of the cult that we're getting into. We're getting into that oracular part. And sure enough, the Korah that it talks about here, they're destroyed on line 11. Kaite antilogia poimainontes. Oh, sorry. Tu Kora apolonto. Yeah, they're destroyed. They're destroyed. Te antilogia. Translators usually put this in the confrontation of or in some kind of, you know, uh, uh, disagreement right without any cult to the word whatsoever right but what's funny is there are logia and antilogia in antiquity and the logia are verses they're verses of oracular utterances from a god sitting between some cherubim yeah now, where do you see that logia for, come out of? Is it coming out of Hellenized Judaism, or is it coming out of some sort of Platonism? Let me finish the letter. Okay, I thought you were done. My bad. First, no, Satan be gone. <laughs> well, all right, make sure we can see this little screen. Then pull it yeah, because all right. you don't know what you're looking okay. at. Okay, as a producer of magnificent videos, I will listen to you and do exactly what you say. Right, uh, verse 14, right? Just like um, that seventh guy from Adam, what was his name? Enoch. Like he prophesied, right? Because these dudes are diviners. And what did he what did he say? Look, you know, the Lord's gonna come in his in, in his holy, you know, myriads of people to do what? To bring this crisis upon everybody. And you just got the plan. This is the plan that is ticking down in your time right now. Yes, wake up. Now is when I snap my fingers. You are part of a society that is controlled by a cult. And this cult's a mystery cult. It's a mystery cult. And it's been controlling society for 2,000 years. Yes, isn't that fantastic? Well, let's see what the plan is within the cult. What was the plan? What is the plan? Right, people, there's millions of views over this stuff, right? Right now, right now in history, you, you guys are sitting on the beginning of the end. It's gorgeousness and gorgeosity. Nobody got that reference yet. Um, so Enoch, what does he say? Look, uh, just to make it quick, because I'm almost done. He says, look, all the stuff that you've done, all that impious stuff that you did, right? All, all, he, that shit's going to get judged. Excuse me. That stuff is going to get judged, right? Because you're following your epithumia. You're following that lustiness. You're following that passion. What are you doing following the passion? You know what I mean? Um, and uh, you're not respecting the rights, man. Um, yeah, so anyway, then he, he goes on to say, look, um, you, my beloved guys, you're all great, you know? And remember, we're, we're at the eschaton. And you say, what? The eschaton is the completion of the cycle. The completion. We're the completion of the cycle, right? That's why he's going to come back, right? Okay, fantastic. And the world burns. Wait, what? Why does it always have to be that way? It's the fire, the ionic fire, right? Purification. You have to be purified. 
This thing has to end in a nuclear conflagration according to the plan. The plan. Fire. Plan. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop just having thrown that in. I do want you to see that this is traditional air. He's going to pull off and say, yeah, yeah, love you guys. It's been nice talking to you. Um, you know, stay faithful. You know, keep the keep the whole honor and glory thing going, you know, to the God, the Soter. The Soter. Which one? The Soter. Right? That's another mystery term. Right? Okay. You know what the Soter is. Why? Because we've known for 700 years what the sotera is, right? And the plan of salvation, right? So, uh, yeah, it didn't just pop into existence, right? So um, I want to know, I wanted to bring in some Enoch, but all I want to say now it, um, is realize that these guys are looking at Enoch, and Enoch tells us, um, quote, much of what you see from Jude is taken from Enoch. So, um, which has great Greek fragments to it. And I highly recommend that you get it and read it because you'll read about why those women were so attracted to those fallen because the, uh, it was the drugs and the magic. And we all know that it was their brilliance that brought us salvation. We know it was. So just wait. Just wait. Which, which group am I in? Um, did I come to the right meeting? Okay, so stop. Those of you who have ears to hear, assimilate those images. Assimilate them now. And so that you can um, be able to stand with me at the beginning of the end. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. I love it. Nice. So I love it, man. I love how you look. You took that approach, the mystery religion approach, the Logia. I got a lot of questions myself, but cares about me. We got other people who have questions and they go first. Yeah. So let's go right to the super chats. No waste of no time. Jeanette McKinnon. How does Enoch and Metatron influence Christian theology? Is Enoch in Hebrew or Greek? And does Jude quote direct passage or paraphrase? Thank you, Jude, Jeanette, for that super chat. Yeah, I'll answer that by saying, um, I, uh, this is Jeanette. Jeanette, get thee immediately to a, pl a place on Amazon where you can get the book of Enoch. Um, R.H. Charles, and you will, it has the answers to each of your questions because it has the Greek text. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, it has a whole section. I'm telling you, these scholars were awesome. Has a whole section on the overlap between Jude. He not only uses the direct quote, and he says in the Greek, as Enoch says, whoop. Right? Quote. Um, and he quotes him directly, but he also uses the same vocabulary. And his concepts are uh, the same within the cult um, image. So and what do just, I mean? Uh, just for her first part, it's in both Hebrew and Greek. Just want to just throw that out there. And the, the Hebrew comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Greek we've had a little bit longer than that. Yeah. Go yeah. That brings up a sore issue for us all. I refuse to jump out of my boat. So I'm doing the Greek. Right. So I would recommend, Jeanette, if you get it, look at the Greek sources. Well, that's yeah. what he's quoting from. He's Jude's using the Greek. So the Hebrew can be the Hebrew all at once. But the fact of the matter is, Jude uses the Greek. Yeah. Point blank, period. Yeah. And the text in the Greek, so the text in the in the actual the text in Jude is behold. He comes with myriads of his holy ones to ex execute judgment on all and destroy the wicked and to convict all the flesh of the wicked of deeds they have done and the proud, har proud hard words that wicked sinners spoke against him. Um, yeah, it's exactly the same. It's, he literally, that particular passage, word for word, he just 
but he just borrows it from the Septuagint. Not the nothing's Septuagint. nothing's ever always exactly word for word, but it's really close. Because yeah, the only difference I was just gonna say the only difference is instead of myriads, it says ten million. Yeah, this this, this yeah, genius yeah. put them side by side so you can actually look at them. Yeah, yeah, and see, and it's never exact. You know, there's a de a little particle missing or something. Right. Or a word restated twice. But you but can yeah, see he's no, using it's a direct. It. See, he's it's their equivalent of a direct quote. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That's that was a good question, actually. Oh, nice what about the question. Metatron thing? Oh, Metatron. I have no comment on that. That's Metatron. Third Enoch. I actually just got into this recently. Third okay. Enoch. It's not First Enoch. It's Third <laughs> Enoch. Metatron comes in the first century. Metatron is little Yahweh. And so there you have. I would say that's a good question. First of all, I would say yes, because you have a little Yahweh who's like the, you know, he's like a savior type of mini God, basically angel, whatever you want to call him. So, yeah, I would say that if it was Christian theology, hell yeah. I don't the, only, the only thing I would add to that is based on the name itself. Um, being the one next to the throne, you know, those are Greek ideas, right? So it couldn't be Hebrew. Um, uh, and, um, there may be something valuable there because that word thronos, they use that like in odd cult ways. For example, a drug that is a multi-mixture is called a mini throne. So it becomes the idea of the throne becomes the cult's code word or what, what, um, Otto Kern would call the Vox Orphica, the Orphic voice. You hear one thing, the regular audience hears one thing, but because we've all been initiated, we hear something else. Yeah, so the Metatron, it, you know, if, Thronos, if Thronos is the equivalent of Pharmacos as the, as the Victorians identified, um, then the cool thing is then you could be talking about the, uh, the actual communion itself, the blood. Yeah. yeah. No, that is a good point. Metatron definitely sounds like it definitely looks like a Greek word. But you know what's crazy? Forget about all that for a second. Because the fact that Jude is using pseudopigrapho, what well, we call it that. It's not really. These are just texts to them. There is no there is no canon. There is no pseudopigrapha. There is no apocrypha. This is just a text from the Christians and or the Jews, and they're using it. Now, yeah, we later oh. on... Yeah, scrolls. later on we title scrolls, right? We later on we classify all this as that's can and that's not. But there's a what defeats that whole entire process of what's canon and what's not is Jude, because if Jude's borrowing from texts that are pseudopigrapha, which means false books, if you're gonna say this is our false books, then why does your canon, your holy canon? Uh, divinely inspired epistle by Jude need to usually actually quote from these pseudo pigrapha texts. That so that defeats the whole purpose of you calling this text canon and that text not. You've it's it's done. Like that's it's over with that. Like you can't you can't say this text is canon and that text is not when the text that's canon is borrowing from the text that's not canon. What do you right. think, Neil? What do you think was the dirty stuff they didn't want? people oh, getting into i mean they took a lot of shit look look, look pe people um not only does, not only does jude quote this but so does peter and a lot of peter hinges upon this very yeah, it's Enochian. sons of god right is but um the, the the folks that edited this text the greek text they put together a whole list of just new testament references that are found from enoch yeah so and towards the end of it's enoch, all over the place you can't the towards the end of Enoch where it starts getting into like the calendar stuff. I don't know if you ever, I don't know if you know, you know, you know what I'm yeah. talking about. It's like, cause Enoch's a long text towards the end. It starts getting into all this calendar stuff and it starts to sound very pagany. It starts <laughs> to get real pagany for a little bit. And I'm not surprised why Christians or anyone else for that matter would try to separate themselves from this later on, not early on early on. This makes total sense. You got yeah. these early Christians. They don't care. They're all into that. Even the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation has a, as a verse that says Hades and Thanatos gave up their dead. Hades and, Than Hades and Thanatos are two gods from Homer, from the Iliad. Why does that Iliad. strike you as odd? 
it doesn't strike me as odd, but it's it's to me it's normal for early Christians, but later Christians are like, no, we can't have that stuff. For some reason, people just ignore that about Revelation. The Revelation's kind of like Enoch in that sense. Enoch has a lot of that stuff going on, a lot of yeah. that weird symbolism and stuff like that. But yeah, so yeah, that's, that's my, that was my whole point. That was a good, really good super chat though. The next they note, they note in this edition, they note that the uh, um, sirens are mentioned. Right. right. That's what I'm they saying. Show up and some of the prophets have sirens in them that the King James would take that out or would change it so that it's, you know, doesn't sound like. Yeah, the King James is tries to clean up all the dirty <laughs> stuff from the Greek. Yeah, that's and that's why you have all these weird, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, that's another topic. But Derek Sanders, thank you for the super chat. How does Christian sibling oracles play into these epistles? Are these letters esoteric? Yeah. So that's a great question because. They called the earliest Christian Sybilis. Their enemies did, right? Celsus, yeah, because says, the, look, these Sybilis, right? That's so, yeah, we know that there are oracles going around. Remember, oracles are something that existed in antiquity. Like, um, we have social apps, you know, um, they had oracles, and these oracles would be handed down generation after generation, written down, and um, you could just consider them public access prophecy, right? So, um, yeah, we know that Virgil has access to them. The Roman government does, right? In the Sibylline books, there's that tradition, which is great. So your question, how does the Christian Sibylline oracles play into these epistles? Well, um, we know that the very first oracle starts out with the flood that is caused when the sons of God hook up with these daughters of men and teach them all their drugs and plant knowledge and root cutting, right? We know that that's happening, right? These are healers, right? We know that that's happening. So, um, and that's right in the first sibling oracle um, that we have in our collection, our current collection as it stands. So you're going to notice the more of the oracles that you read, that they have a direct hand in the environment. Um, you have the eschaton. The Sibyl will tell you about the eschaton. You think it was like a group of 12 men who made up the idea of the apocalypse? Really? You think it was, first of all, there's like 50 of these stupid things, right? right. When, I say, when I say stupid, I just mean it's a method of writing, right? It's so popular. It's, oh, he wrote an apocalypse. Apocalyptic literature. That's what it is. <laughs> For like 200 years, it was like, the, it was the thing. <laughs> So, but this is the one, and this is what's cool. History has come down to this one. And it makes me, it makes me wonder what is special about John's apocalypse, by the way, that talks about the way of Cain and the throne of Satan, right? So Jude is right there. He's opening it up. He's the opening act. I'm telling you. you get yeah, he's right before it. They put it they, when they put that together, they did that for a reason because it plays mm -hmm. right into it. That Enochian, huh? Enochian uh, ID like worldview, and then boom, revelation right after that. So yeah, yeah that makes sense. Thank you for and that. John, super John even references them, but oh, and I was just gonna say the later Christian sibling oracles make it even more like play into what you're saying even more because the later Christian sibling oracles from like the 13th, 12th century ninth century though like the real like medieval ones they are like like continuing revelation basically like the way they're i have it sitting right here where it has like oh the mahomet who is the baphomet and anyone who wears a turban has the mark of the beast like they're still talking about the mark of the beast 900 years later so yeah. like the sibylline the sibylists are clearly in the same uh genre as these apocalyptic writers for sure yeah. And are these letters esoteric? Yes, yes. Any and what's the brand of what's the the mark of any esoteric knowledge? That it has to be decoded. You have to be initiated to gain access. To be born again, you have to enter as the little child. Why do they call it the little child? Because that's the initiate. That's right. how they present you. Yeah. Right, we, nice. you and I were just talking about the Vestal Virgins. The yeah. Vestal Virgin was a huge, yeah. big deal, and they're the ones who held the Sibylline oracles. So they're they're whether whether it's a direct connection, 
but it's, there's an indirect connection to how this Roman Christian church plays out because you had these vessels of virgins who are like six years old being initiated into this cult for that. They have to be there for 30 years. They have 10 years of being a student, 10 years of being a servant. And then the last 10 years of their time as a vessel of virgin, they spend being a teacher and then they're allowed yeah, to retire. What, what did they learn? What did it say they were learning? Do you remember the, some of the, the sibling oracles? Yeah, no, it's that, that text that you said specifically says it talks about the um, different arts that they would learn. Right, right. Among them being yeah. astronomy. They had to know astronomy and right. dance. They had to know music and yeah. geometry and yeah, pharmacology the, or what the, we would The call. way they become elites, though, not just from being yeah. vestal virgins, the way they become elites is because the high priest, Pantheus Maximus, who was Julius Caesar, Augustus, Tiberius, they were all the, the high priests. After Julius Caesar, there's never a high priest that's not Caesar. It's always the Caesar. Before that, it was always someone else. But Julius Caesar, I'm sorry, Lepidus was a high priest before, in between Caesar and Augustus. I forgot about What's that. What's a Pontifex? He so said the, but Pontifex. Pontifex Maximus would take the Vestal Virgin, and he they would become his daughters. They're legally adopted by him. They are his daughters. And then when they finish their 30-year term, they're 36 years old because they're like six years old when they get initiated, 36, 37, 38 years old, and they finish their term, he would marry them off to an elite somebody, a king, a governor, somebody important, somebody in Gaul who's in charge of a whole kingdom, somebody in, I don't know, somebody in Turkey who's in charge of a whole kingdom, and he would marry them off to one of his Sibylline oracle daughters. And that would that would that would create a, a royal marriage. And it would it would it would tie the bonds in between all these places they conquered. And these Sibylline Oracle women were so they're so th sought after to be married to because they would get a pension in land. And it, so all these, all these elitists, all these like big time people in the, in the Roman empire wanted to marry one of them because then they would have Julius Caesar as their father-in-law. So they would be like, like it became a big deal. It became one oh, of the elite systems in Roman religion. The Pontifex is the one literally who guards the bridge the pathway. The Pontifex is the guardian of the pathway. And who made up the audience? You know, just to get, get in your time machine, go back and smell the dirt, right? Who made the Pontifex, right? This thing didn't just come out of the friggin' sky. Somebody had to say, hey, well, a Pontifex Plutarch, is. Plutarch says that the Pontifex Maximus is as old as Rhodes. That's a direct quote. Numa. Pontifex Maximus is as old as Rhodes. That's what he says. Numa, Numa received, received again. This is also Plutarch. <laughs> yeah, Numa, Numa, Plutarch's life of Numa. Who is Numa? He's Amun backwards. Um, he was, oh, wow. a, yeah, he was a dude. Well, it's an Etruscan thing. You'll notice, Neil, as you read the PGM, the Magical Papyri. But they do this switch well, where they'll read a word backwards. Oh, now, the Sator Rotas. Yeah. Sator Rotas. And then it's like there's a huge diagram thing. I right. should pull it's that up. It's because those are oral. Those are orally expressed in the incantation. So, yeah, you're opening gateways. Look at this, guys. You better run. The Inquisition's coming. Um, yeah. Uh, Numa was one of the first kings of Rome. He was the second. And he was a Sabine dude. And he said, look, I'm going to spend all my time. I'm going to retire early and I'm going to spend all my time in a grove with a Sybil. And her name is Egeria and she is a muse divine. And um, I'm going to know her for a long time, but she will never age the whole time that I know her. And I'll get everything that comes to Roman religion I get it from her. So the tradition is that Numa had the religion of Rome handed down through this muse. Yeah. Whose, whose name was Egeria. I just want to show this real quick before we get to the next super chat. Yeah, That's go crazy. ahead. That, that was a that was a crazy story though. I like that. I love Plutarch. Yeah. So if you look at this thing, it's a magical table, basically. It's like for magical incantations or what whatnot. And you see it says Sator. I got some uh I got some 
hold on. Okay. Sator, Rotas, Opera, Tenet. And it's all that is is a bunch of words backwards from each other. So hold on a second. Let me just get rid of this comment. So you, th there's one of them, Sator. Nobody really knows what it means. It's just a bunch of words. And then you had this one, Abracadabra. This is not just some made up new, modern thing that people put in their fantasy shows. This is going back to the to the Gnostics, Abracadabra. And you can see how the words backwards are the same front words, Abracadabra, Abracadabra. So this is like some weird magic shit going on from back in the day, man. If you wanted to see how that thing works, <laughs> you could you could learn the magic of the Sator. Yeah, you know? that's what the Sator, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's the next one? Derek Sanders, thank you for that super chat. Rotas, oh. it turns. You didn't, he's gonna, all right, somebody, I'm commanding a demon. Take him back to the seven spheres and get him to learn his physics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I Neil, where are, we, where are we going? I thought that we were going to have, I thought oh, we were going to have there's there's Ariel. questions. Here he is. No, these Ariel. are questions. These are, what do you mean? What do you think this is in the question? It says, oh, FL right. says, messengers abandoning first estates, the difference in constellations as imagined from Mars versus as viewed from Earth. Also, just one thing I wanted to throw in real quick um, that kind of connects the whole sibling stuff to what you're talking about, Enoch. So I just happened to look up what was, um, you know, Enoch's lineage. His mother's name was, uh, um, depending on how it's vocalized, but basically Aleph Vav, uh, or wait, hold on, let me, basically it's a cognate with Awa. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. Um, it, it's like avon, which literally means like transgression or sin or iniquity. But um, what's interesting is that not only does it mean that, which you know has this context within you know these uh, these older traditions, but it also has it's like ewan, which is really close to you know ewan, which is really close cool. to ewa ewoi. Yeah. You're getting you're, you're getting Ariel into something that you you know Plutarch's around. Yeah, Plutarch's around because Plutarch is saying the Jews, man, the Jews are Bacchans. Let me tell you how. And then there's a giant hole in the text, right? But he yeah. starts to describe it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's I saw that too. I saw that too. Yeah, let's not keep this person waiting though, for the super chat. Let's not keep this person waiting. Messengers yeah. abandoning first estates. The difference in constellations as imagined from Mars versus as viewed from Earth. Interesting. Thank you, FL, for that super chat. Any answer, Neil? Um, I don't, I'm not sure what he means. Um, messengers abandoning first estates. Is he talking about the fallen angels? And I, I would say, in response, my personal, from different, not just my personal, but just from talking to some scholars on this subject, I think there's some connection between the Titans and the Olympians happening when you look at these fallen demons i guess you would call them demons and angels so the demon and angel dichotomy is sort of coming out of this idea of the dewas the d the daemons the demons and the gods the the olympians or the titans so you see that all throughout the world not just in the west but even in vedic mythology you have the um what do they call them they call them the sura asuras or asuras and the and the Dewas, and you have the two different sides. And on one side, you have Mithra, and you have uh, Varuna, and on the other side, you have Krishna and Shiva, and they're they're opposing each other, and they're all. It's it's just you know you see that type of thing happening. So yeah, that's a good. That's I would, that's what I would say. You have anything to say about that? At least what I'm gathering from this, how they're saying the difference in constellations as imagined from Mars versus as viewed on Earth. I think they're implying that they think that humanity or humanity's ancestors or something once inhabited Mars and basically that like you would have a different perception of how the constellations. I don't know. I don't know how different it would be though. It's not that far away. It's, I think you yeah. would still have a same, you still see the same stuff. It's that instead of seeing Mars, you'd see earth. <laughs> you know what I mean? It'd be like, it'd be like that. You'd see a big green blue thing sitting, not big, but you know what I mean? You'd, you'd be able to see that from like telescopes and shit. But um, that's my. I don't, I'm not. I look. I'm no expert in this at all. So, somebody who's into like science and astronomy is probably thinking this dude's an idiot. So don't take my word on that. It's just what I think. But um, 
I was I was I was more going off of his first question, but yeah. Second question, I don't know. Not, that's a good question though. Jim Markstein, thank you for the super chat. Says, do you think Ophites and Nicolations really drank the cups of Pornea? <laughs> what do you think about that, Amon? That's for you. Yeah, we know they drank semen. We know they do. Well, the a lot they're, of scholars complained think, about. A lot they're of compl- scholars think that that was them talking shit. Make it and it wasn't that it's not true. Why? Yeah, those scholars don't do the medicine. I, so, I, I'm not, so I'm right, not saying right. No, no, no. no. Right. Uh, here, no, I draw the line. I draw the line. This is where out comes the lightsaber. These <laughs> scholars don't do philology, they don't study the medicine. How do I know that? Because I was in philology, I Gaelic. was in the medicine, and they don't study it. Okay, so let me ask you this. I, I, let's say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak for the, I'm going to play scholar's advocate right now. Yes. Where in Galen or any of these texts you see and I, I, and them drinking semen? His, his entire book on drugs, um, compound drugs. Oh, no. You there? He'll be back. He'll be back. He'll be back. Because you know what? I, I, I'm gonna, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I hope you, when you come back, I'll ask you again. We got to, I want to see this text because I want to see some of this stuff. I want to see Galen talking about Nicolations actually doing this thing. Because all I know is you have hostile witnesses like Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Justin Martyr, these guys, these, and the guy, whoever wrote Nicol, whoever wrote Revelation, and whoever wrote Revelation is saying these scumbags are drinking pornea. And so, I see why scholars think that it might not. I would love to see these texts. Um, I know you have them. I believe you 100%. Because I know that I know you, every time you said something like this, and I was like, huh? You showed me the text in Greek from the original source, and it turns out that you're not fucking bullshit. So, I, I actually sh- I showed you this one, bro. I sent it to you. Epiphanius of Samos talks about them drinking semen. As communion in the right, brah. You oh, don't wow. need Galen's. You don't need Galen's description. You know what I like is his description of that serious boy juice. This is what you get, Neil. You want it. You wanted to ask about it. Well, you just know, keep it, keep it PG. Don't do it. I'm gonna say nothing crazy. Your audience has to know. People, you no, gotta no, know. No, 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 no. He's always telling. He's always telling. No, keep no. It, he, keep it. Keep it yeah. as scholarly as possible. Whatever you're about to say. But say it. Go ahead. You can say it. He says it's a serious. I published on this. I believe. I know. That's. I know. There is a serious component of boy ejaculate that is translucent, <laughs> and that it looks like the serum that you can milk a girl whose breasts are premature and only. So this is what size, the text actually says. Only the size of grapes, and it's called X. Now, you're telling me there's a text in Greek that says what you just said. Yes, I'm telling you there's a text that that talks about Galen, that talks about all of the serous fluids. Yeah, the antidotes. It's in the context of the antidotes. One of these days. Neil, Neil, Silentio, go to Litwa. Go to the, go to your men, you know, because all your, all your guys who do that. Well, you know, you've got some women. Go to Elaine. From Harvard, go to the religious scholars at once and tell them, get thee to the book of Galen's antidotes. And I'll, look I'll for down the, to show them. I'm down and to show look them. for the breasts and the formula that comes from them that's given to Nero, by the way. Tell them, go now. It's the book of the antidotes. Go. We'll check it Run. out. Elaine Pagels, do you hear me? Run, Elaine. Can you, can Run and you, find you, you it, Elaine. Have, you don't happen to have it with you right now to share, do you? Dude, it's in Greek. Of course I've got it. I've got the Greek text. I'll, yes. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. <laughs> Would you like to see it? All right. Oh, is yeah. that right? Look at this. Okay, for the audience, Neil's pulling down on me right here. So, a- No, no, you don't, have, you don't have to do it now. We can do it next time. Ask some good questions. No, no, no. Skip you, no, bro. I, Skip I, you. No, I don't I'm wanna, going. I, you want to go with gloves? Have, I'll go gloves out. Just a minute. We have super chats, Let's finish Hold Super Chats first. Oh, uh, okay. can I just address this one real quick? Yeah. Is, so th- there's a lot of discussion in the Talmud talking about how you shouldn't do this or that. Like, like, like I'm looking at this thing right now. I, um, I'll, I'll share it because I think it's relevant. 
Um, but like, there's a like, there's too much talk of this that it it, it seems like even before the church, you're dealing with some stuff that you could argue it's polemics, but it's like it almost seems so like it's I, very I don't, I don't, specific, specific. Yeah. So here. like, no, I that's what I'm saying about this whole pornea thing. The way the, the the what they're charging them with is so specific that it sounds like it might be real. All right, so look at this. I don't want to take uh, too much time because we have some. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I'll just take a minute real quick. Yeah. So here, so it says the Gemara says. Uh, oh wait, here. Um, if a priest was eating teruma, which is like the um like ascension offering, and he sensed that his limbs quaked, indicating that a seminal emission was imminent, he should firmly hold his penis to prevent the emission from leaving his body and swallow the teruma while ritually pure. A difficulty was raised with regard to this Mishnah. May he, however, hold his penis. But this isn't taught in a Baraita that Ra Rav Eliezer says, with regard to anyone who holds his penis and urinates, it is considered as though he is bringing a flood to the world, as yeah. masturbation was one of the sins that led to the flood. So but that's so they're talking yeah. about masturbation here. You know, well, we could just get, like, you know, is that what he's basically getting at? Not, not, not just that, but their connection, it's not just masturbation. It's seen as, like, it's correlated with child sacrifice because they viewed the seed as already being living. And yeah. so with, with this, essentially, if you're living in a world where, they you know, count your star sign on the day of your conception, not your birth. Yeah. But yeah. So if you're, you know, if you're living in a society, like all societies where people pleasure themselves and they're viewing this, it, like it's being viewed within this context where it's like, Oh, you're essentially killing something. Is it really that strange to have like, to have people consuming sure. that, I mean, like you're. No, um, I get what you're saying. That I'm, I'm not. I would not be surprised. Actually, I'm not. I believe I'm not. It's not I'm not even doubting Amon. What the only reason why I'm being this way is because I know how there's people out there who are going to say he's he. What is he drunk? Like people do think I'm. I'm just trying to get his point across for him. I'm trying to. I don't no, doubt no. what he's saying. I've never doubted what you said, dude. Yeah, but, no, you know. no, good. And you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Yeah. But Neil, because I won't say anything that I don't have a source for. I know. You've been, dude, you've been you on point the, the whole time since we met. If I, you guys I, I, want the plainest, um, a more modern image of it, you can go right to Jules Michelet on the history of Satanism um, and witchcraft. Sure. And when she sits over the tripod, when this Vir Virgo sits over the tripod after performing fellatio on Lucifer, she ejaculates into a bowl, a tripod, which you then consume. You give out to the uh, congregation right. of That's what I'm saying. When we get the text, we'll show this, but I want to, I don't want to keep people waiting too long on this super chat. Oh, okay. Okay. That's all. Okay. Mandy, thank you for this super chat. You guys are on again. I wonder from last video, what is the coordinary of the sky for initiation? If you can say. You know what is the quaternary? Um, no, I can't say. <laughs> I honestly, Mandy, I I'm so happy to see you in the chat and thank you for the super chat. I am having trouble understanding the question. If you you don't have to send another super chat, I'm looking at the 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 chat. I'm looking where the who's. I saw you just said Saturn, Holy Father. Uh, can you send and can you reform the question so I understand it better? You got it's going, one, no, it's okay. It's a oh, Mandy, from last I video. Okay, this is from last video. What I is understand. the ordinary of the sky for the initiation? I understand your I understand your question. And as the initiations um progress through the year, right? The mysteries are at different here, here times. She is. Amon said, "If you are initiated, you will know the sky in four parts." Yeah, I, I was, I was wondering if this is what you meant. Yeah, if you have the sky divided up into four sections, but those are based on the seasons as well, because the, they talk about when the sun rises and when the sun sets during each time of the year. So that's why you have twelve constellations, four seasons, and I guess my, I don't know. What, so is that so clear? In late, look, this is the, this is the best I can do, Mandy. It's the, it's the closest I can get you um, without lying to you or trying to sell you a book. Cause I don't want to do either of those things. Right. You're just Mandy. So I'm, I'm going to be nice. Right. And be another human being to you. Um, the two things that I can get close with is each of these initiations are at a different time of the year. Um, the Ellicinian, for example, the big one just happened in late September. Okay, so um, depending upon their quartering of the sky, 
It would be from that time of year, from their perspective on the map. But having said that, having read enough John of Littus, I can tell you, for example, um, everything that they do with respect to these initiations is controlled by a cycle of the moon in addition to the sun. So whatever the... Uh, when the horns are in the position that they need to be for like the Hecatean rites are all done. And they'll talk about uh, at the, when, when the moon is dark, they'll talk about lettuce. This I'm confusing you, but this will make it clear. John Littus says, look, you can chart everything out according to the position of the moon in what constant, when, what house it is. Um, and depending, and then he associates that with lightning, right? With signs, different signs. So when you're talking about initiates at that pre-dawn resurrection who are there at Eleusis watching the queen or the Korah be resurrected, um, you're talking about the time of the dawn star, right? Yeah. Now, and well, you know what? Something crazy is that uh, when, when Augustus got initiated into Eleusis, he brought with him a... A um a messenger sent by King, what's his name? King, oh, the the Indian King, King Porus actually. His, uh, oddly, the same name as the king under Alexander. Same name, but different king. King Porus sends over seven messengers to Augustus with lions and or not lions, tigers and perfumes and gifts from the east. And only three of them survive. Four of them die on the way there. And they get there, and one of them he was because the Illusionian mysteries were so famous, everyone in the world knew about it. And the one, the one of the messengers wanted to go with Augustus and get initiated, and they did. And it was off season though; they opened it up just for Augustus, off season. And this guy got initiated into the rites, took the kaikion, went through the ritual, and whatever happened, his mind was blown so much, he jumped into a fire and killed himself. Because he was ready to go, he's ready for the afterlife. That's what. That's how. That's how intense these rites were. That's when how you're born again, when you're born again into the way, they say you lose your fear of death. We saw okay. that in the Orphic fragments. All you over lose the, your fear. Not of just death. one time. All over the fragments. All, every time the Illusion and Mysteries are mentioned, it's always talking about that fear of death. That fear of Whoa. death. Oh, yeah. And so I that's did. what it was centered around. It was. It was a salvation cult. That's what it was. Yeah, soteria, salvation, yeah. right? I, Same I, word. I just realized, you know, the story of the, um, you know, the people who were thrown into the furnace by what was it, Nebuchadnezzar? Or, yeah, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar yeah. and also um, Nimrod in a different time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so like that's also kind of going along with that. But so I found something that was really interesting because how you're talking about the Eleusinian mysteries being, you know, during late, um, late. Uh, your screen bigger. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, so this is from um I, I found a little bit more. A little bit more. Okay. Hit that okay button too. That thing kind of okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is from the Zohar. Come and see on that day of Rosh Hashanah, the moon. Um, and then so this is like giving context, but um feminine tree uh, like feminine quality of God, tree of knowledge, sacredness of this world is gathered and does not shine until the tenth day of the month. When all of Israel return in complete repentance and the supernal mother, transcendent godliness, tree of life, again shines upon it. On that day, Yom Kippur, the moon, receives the illuminations of the supernal mother and joy abounds everywhere. Hence it is written, for it is a day of atonement, Yom Kippur. It should have said Yom Kippur in the singular. What is the meaning of Yom Kippurim in the plural? This is because this is the time when the two lights shine together. And so like... So like, there, so not, not to cut you off, but Mandy, think about that though. Now, even though this is not the same as the mystery religions, it is sort of its own mystery religion in that sense. Because this yeah. is the this is the holiest time of the year, and yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, just the other thing I want to touch on is like this idea that you know there's this um, you know cycle of like mystery traditions, and it's like it's not the way that Judaism is viewed, but like in a way, it kind of is. Like you have you know this cycle that repeats itself, and the idea is that you know even though you might celebrate this thing that you celebrated last year, you're a new person this year. You're going through new things. It's a new year. You know, you're, you're essentially a new person. Right. And it's this idea of growth and, um, 
I mean, like it's, there's so much like esoteric stuff that it's like, it's so connected that I have to wonder whether or not like essentially Judaism as it evolved did so in a way that was deliberately like less, you know, esoteric while still having those things within it. It's kind of like it de-emphasized it because of the fact that they, you know, it, um, Jews didn't want to be seen as others by, or, or as othered by, you know, Muslims or Christians. Um, and so as a result, they kind of, um, or not appropriate, but they, um, you know, acculturated themselves to fit the cultures they lived in. Yeah. Yeah. And they've got that Oracle thing going. They got prophets and they got that whole Oracle thing going with the telesteria in the tent where God comes to them. Yeah. They've got all of that stuff. So it's not surprising it, the, their fever for prophecy was not its own entity, that it was something bigger, part of, part of a much bigger. Do we have that girl anywhere? Do we have that Asherah anywhere that can produce that oracular medicine? Yeah. Uh, well, hey, shout yeah, out, know, shout right? out real quick. Shout out, by the way, really quick to the, um, to the young women who are dying for lady liberty in iran shout out to you girls oh yeah those protests going on i, I yeah. dude i i i second that that is some like we okay let me just i'm just gonna pull, pull this down for a second while that's i'm glad you brought that up because this is part of this part of the reason why i had this channel is to it, it give people education on religion and then mythology and how none, none of none of them are important none of them are the true one there it's an extension of the self the greeks talk about know thyself that's where it all starts it's not just like this this is the only way dogmatism is what i strongly go against now we talk about uh we we have our rallies and we have our marches over here in america for various things those are all great those are all that's part of democracy but none of us none of us have to deal with the trying to do the same thing in a country like iran just think about that. Those are some very, very um, courageous individuals. And they got my support all day long. It's whatever I could do. Like I, You know what I'm saying? Like Those people are the heroes of the world who stand up against things, then risk their lives literally. Risk their lives literally. We go, like, we do it here, and we get, we get, like, praised for it. Like, oh yeah, you went to the you went to the rally. Yeah, good for you. That's great. Yeah. You might even get if you're in college student, you might even get extra credit for it. Over there, that ain't happening. You're going to jail. You're going to get your you're going to lose your job. You're going to get harassed. You're going to get so yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, Amon. And I yeah, second yeah. that. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, there's a super chat. And it's from Mandy again. Mandy, thank you for the super chat. Does anyone else want to do the mystery initiation? I do for real. Whoop. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, let's do it. And I, oh, that's why I brought this image up because it shows the, the four quarters. You know what I mean? Like the corners. Yeah. And I almost wonder, I almost wonder, because this is a Mithraic mos mosaic. And I almost wonder if those symbols in, in the corners with the fishes has something to do with, I don't know. I don't know what you guys think. That's a, yeah, that's an ion, bro. That band going around like that's an ion. So yeah, you you're. Well, what do you think we should do about this question? Do you think we should set up, think we should set up a, a, a religion con? You know how there's like Comic Con or something. I think we should do something. No, like no, that. no. I think we should tell Mandy um, to bring her into the picture in order for us to perform the mystery. In order for us to have it back, we have to have a sotera. We have to have she who possesses the cup. Um, who could bring you the communion that would initiate the death to life transference? Because um, we'd have to follow it like they did it in antiquity. If you want to see her raised from the dead, if you want to see the queen of the underworld come back, if you want that Sybil, you would, you would have to bring her back. You would have to have somebody who was willing to be trained somebody who is willing to learn the dance, the song, and somebody who is willing to be possessed. Yeah. Right? In, in, in order to get there so that she could manufacture the communion um, that gives us all ionic life. 
by the way, this is this is not a super chat, but it's a good question. I, and like I say, if, if I see questions and because you know I can't like see everything, but I saw I just happened to see this one, and this is um, Ariel. You might be able to because this is this sounds like an initiation thing. When, I've I've run through the Talmud a little bit. I've seen the pro, the, the procedure with the with the cube with wrapping your hand, wrapping your hand around. What does the cube thing do? By the way, thank you, Ch, for the question. What does the cube thing do that the jewelry wear on the in on the forehead? So um, I, I'm guessing they're probably referring to to fill in, and it, it's interesting because the way it gets translated typically is phylacteries, which is I mean, phylacteries are always magical items. That's one thing to point out. But um, ba basically, it's taken from I forget exactly where it is, but it's like. Um, you, you, like you will bind them on, on your wrist or uh, on your arm and between, uh, and on your forehead between, uh, between your eyes. It's, uh, it's this idea of like, um, that, um, having it on your arm that it's close to your heart. Um, so it's like your, um, it, basically it's, um, so you wrap it seven times around your arm. So there you also have the seven. Um, but then you have, um, uh, was it you, you put it on the head as well and it it has um these scrolls in it that have uh i, I forget exactly what it is but it's from the torah and it I, it's the verse where it says like you, you know you'll bind it on your forehead and um on your forearm and that stuff but um it, it's basically about this idea of like i i do yeah there, there's a lot of like um this idea that like when you're wrapped in it you're wrapped in god's presence there's a lot of they put they put Torah scrolls in the actual cube. By the way, here's an image of it. This is from my. Can you see that? So here, I'm gonna put myself on the full screen for a second. This is from the Penguin edition of the Talmud selection. Obviously, oh, this, this is not even one percent of the Talmud, but this is like selections from it, and they give you this little image. So, if anyone was wondering what we're talking about, I just wanted to show them what we're talking about. So, you're saying that they put the scrolls inside that black cube? And yeah, it's it, it's kind of like a mezuzah in that way. Another thing that's really interesting is that um the so there's a shin on the on the block on the box that um it represents I think it's Shaddai, but I mean there, there's probably also like an understanding that it also represents Shekhinah. I'm I'm not hundred percent sure on that. I don't want to speak to that. But what's interesting is that it doesn't have three uh, so it's not like a um it's not like this, it's like this. It has four um like forearms which yeah. also i wonder you know is there maybe this connection with like the four you know how you can divide the year into four parts i don't know like that that's yeah, just kind you of know what i noticed about that because rabbi tovaya did this procedure with somebody on his channel and it was somebody who was coming to someone who was getting um converted basically which is not like a thing that you do every day the jews aren't going out converting people he wanted to be converted and this is what the procedure he did with him was. So is this an initiation thing? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, I'm going to say something. Perfect spot. I'm going to say something funny to answer that. Odd. And you're going to think, oh, yeah, where's the source? And then I'm going to give it I, to well, you. I'm a source guy. I need the source. I'm, gonna give, I'm good. Good for you, Neil. I like that about you. There's some things that charm me about you. That's one <laughs> of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to give you the source. So. What am I going to say that's crazy? The the things that you just showed, the accoutrements that you just showed, those are all necromantic accoutrements that are used in the practice of the oldest form of magic that we know in the Western world. And you say they've got stuff written on them. What do they have written on them? They have the oracles written on them, you boneheads. And how do we know that? Watch. Watch what comes up. I'm going to share this with you. Oh, you got a screen yeah. and everything. All right. This is now, this is the, this is the I'm one I've been wanting. Yeah. This is classical philology, bro. Okay. Classical philology. What is a logion? It's an oracle, especially one preserved from antiquity. And then you get a whole bunch of sources. Look at Roman numeral number two. What else is a logion? Oh, it's the oracular best breastplate worn by the Jewish high priest. Mm -hmm. What are the logia at the bottom that you see in Aristeus? They're the prophecies, you morons, right? The prophecies. That, that's, I, I, that's, and that's, that's the question I asked you 
when I butted in too early. Was this Logion concept? Does it come out of the Platonist world? Because I know Plato talks about oh. this Logos. Or way is this before, more... way before, way before Plato? So you think, okay, so that now when this gets into Judaism, you think they're both coming from a, a common ancestor with these Logion ideas? They're prof yeah, they're prophetic utterances that you're able to get through your mystery. Yeah, you're right. talking. We're, talk we're talking. Uh, talking. Um, what is it called? Which age is that? The Bronze Age, right? Bronze yeah, Age. Yeah, this is this is Saturnian stuff. Bronze Age dactylic hexameter. So we're going back before. We're pushing that before the generation of Homer, right? Before to the late Bronze Age, when this character Orpheus had some kind of profound influence, right? So, yeah. yeah, that's what we're doing. Late Bronze Age. And these Logia, you know, it's always started by a woman. Why? Because that's the mystery, you jerk off. Oh, I'm so, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's shame on me. I, I, now I'm going to get us. Now, Disney. I, I, Disney I, is not going to take us. I, I have it pulled up if you, um, if you want me to read it. It's a really good part. Um, like the part that's actually put into the... Um, Okay, yeah. So, um, so it starts with Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. So that's Hero Israel. The, um, you know, Adonai is our God. Adonai alone. Um, but so you shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Take to heart these instructions which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home, when you are away, when you lie down, and when you get up. Okay, so that that's also like interesting because this concept of like you know going to sleep and waking up. Um, but in that case, it's like the actual words, but then, uh, the next part is bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. And then here it says a symbol others frontlet. So, uh, it gets interpreted different and then inscribe them on doorposts on your house and on your gates. That's the mezuzah. And then it goes on to like, you know, um, Yahweh did this, uh, for you, but um, the other thing that I wanted to address before we got too far off from it. Can I just it, say that's oh, that's, yeah. be that's beautiful Jewish necromantic magic. You know, it's there's no reason to be ashamed. There's no, you can come out of the closet. The magic's there, you know. It's not, you know, it's not the, it's not the demons under your altars anymore, right? Oh, this is interesting, guys. Exodus 8, 19. I forgot about this. The magician said to the Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hard. The verse right before this, though, I wish he would have put that in there as well. And verse 18 says the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts. They could not since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere. Like this, this idea of the secret arts. Like, okay. What's the finger of God? Wait, you've got the it. Dactylians. I was going to say that. Right, the dactyls. The dactyls, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're addressing this in the in the in the text. Now I know I get it that they're a po Moses is on the opposite side of these people, right? These magi, whoever these are. But still, it's in the text as if it's real. They're not saying that these were fake magicians. They're and they and they, that all, they all failed. No, they're coming out. They're doing real magic right in front of Moses. But Moses yeah. is just upping them. So you got to remember. This all that stuff's in the Old Testament too. Yeah, they're not, they're not denying that it's real. They're saying that it's real. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and even like the, Saul. You do, he, you've been... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, even Saul. He, um, you know, he, um, he hires the services of the. It gets translated as the Witch of Endor, but or Endor, but literally Balat of Endor. And so, if you break that down, Balat, the mistress of. We, we're not sure what it's from, but probably from the root of, which, you know, means father or ancestor. And so it's like the, the mistress of ancestors, the necromantrix of Endor. And so um, basically, it doesn't say that she's false. It ends up being that, oh, he shouldn't have listened to her because she told him he was going to die that day. And, right. you know, whether or not it, the reason that he died was because he was depressed that he heard he was going to die. And so he fell on his sword. Or whether she prophesied and you know she was telling the truth at the end of the day it's not said that she was you know a scammer it wasn't saying that she's a false you know like um oh no yeah she, she legitimately prophesied 
he he legitimately used divination, contacted dead people. Sa- Samuel comes up. Samuel's like, "What do you want from me? I'm I'm resting down in Sheol, and you you're going to bother me? Like leave me leave me alone, bro." <laughs> he kind of you, you know what you know what verse I'm talking about. Or he gets a hold of Samuel. Yes, yeah. yes, and, yeah. and yeah. So and so it doesn't say that it didn't work. It works, and they're not. We're not talking about ordained priest in the holy of holies. We're talking about regular people who are p- considered pagans and idolaters doing real magic in the Bible. Therefore, they're not opposing that it's not real. Like I, I, that, I'm not sure if I make it sense or not, but. Someone, I'm sure one person understands what I'm saying. Which is what our angels are getting in such big trouble for. Right. They're, they're passing that art onto these women that they've decided. And the, yeah. And the reason why I'm bringing that up, though, is because later on, especially right now with all these like these Christians who have just no, no allure to them, that you know, like they're just not, they're, they're just like these pastors and in these like conservative churches who are like Trump, whatever they're, they have like, they try to say, Oh, all these other Vedic and all these other pagan worships, they're all fake and magic's not real, but it's like your Bible says otherwise. <laughs> you know what I mean? Your Bible doesn't say that your Bible says that stuff's real and it, it's working. Like I'm just saying. Also. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Alman. No, no, no. I was just going to say a brilliant job on bringing, bringing that out. Um, yeah. Ariel, uh, bringing out the actual magic that's there, right. right? Isn't that yeah, gorgeous? So, so yeah, here I, I pulled it up. So you have Balat, um, which is a mistress or a female owner or a sorceress, necromancer. Um, um, but here you have so Balat of uh, wa- water skin bottle or a necromancer, ghost or practice of necromancy um, of Endor. But what's interesting here? So um, the word for um, divine is kasmi divine for me hold on and what's interesting about this is that the word kasam or kosem it means to practice divination but i do wonder is it maybe also a cognate with cosmo like like, like the you know the root cosmo like as an order or like you know the cosmos and this practice of you know divining the future from the stars mm-hmm. I, I don't know that might be a bit of a stretch no. but um, okay. I've never heard. I've never heard that proposed. I've never seen it written. But that does not mean that you are not on to a common root there. So yeah, nice, nicely done, sir. Um, the other thing here is the term yidoni, a knower, what or one who has a familiar spirit, and um, it, it's just interesting because it's like the, it's this idea that there's a spirit that inhabits someone that that that's re- responsible for them um essentially you know speaking forth and the thing is it doesn't actually say that it's uh uh or so actually uh scratch that but um the, the thing that i think is really important there is that this con- context of yidoni within this context it's see- seen as bad because it's being used for necromancy but i do kind of wonder are there other contexts in which that was used? But th- that's a lot of speculation. Also, but, yeah. So just to go back to the Cosme thing, it sounds like a word that would be equated to astrologer. Oh yeah, it is. You know, astrology dealing with the sky and the, and the stars. Cosme, it's the same thing, right? <clears throat> and give them some credit too. These vessels that are learning all their astrology. They're learning about how to how to follow eclipses. They're learning about the movement of the planetes and through their houses and what those powers are and what they bring. Why do you think it's those dudes that show up to, you know, uh, uh, to Jesus and they're like, this is the dude. Right. We know because we've dated it to the stars. Right. You have the stars. Right. That's that's the zone we're in with this necromancy. Right. So when Jesus is raising people from the dead, don't think he's not doing anything different from what ancient necromancers did. He's also talking to demons like they, like their friends, like, like right. hey, James, Jesus, I know you. What's going on, buddy? Yeah. yeah can you please, please get out of those pigs for me. It, it, they're, all, they're, all, they're all like and then and then he, when they say, OK, who is this man casting out demons? Is he not one himself? So, something along the lines of that. Jesus is like it, it, oh, a house divided against itself can't stand. 
And it's almost like he's not even like denying like he's doing some crazy divination shit, but he's basically saying, "Yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm about that life." And you know, like, what, that's the, that's the that's the vibe I get from him. You know what I mean? It's what made the exorcisms um, among the Christians because they have to get out those influences. The early church fathers that were so into the purgations, you have to cleanse these mystery religions are all about cleansing. Right. You have to cleanse or baptize or wash out yeah. some sort of impurity. Do you know that the Eshman cult, the more I'm learning, I'm so I've been doing a lot of digging into the Eshman cult, trying to find anything I could find on this. Cause there's not a lot of scholarship there. Actually, no, there's more than I thought. There's some real good scholarship done on this Eshman cult. And there's the, the temple still sitting there in Beirut and in, in Lebanon. And the whole entire cult was centered around ablution and bath taking baths and they have in the temple they have little babies little statues of babies called temple boys and they were like initiates basically yeah I'll, I'll show you what i mean i'm gonna get a picture of it right now but, oh, but what the point i'm getting at is this whole entire cult of eshman the whole entire cult of eshman was was centered around cleansing healing ablution oiling and taking baths so like here here's one of these temple boys they have it in a museum this is from oh my god look at this this is from the temple of eshman in beirut and there was like 10 of these things not we just don't one see it. we don't I'm, see it i'm yeah. pulling it up right now hold on there was like 10 of these things look oh and, wow. and if you don't believe me just look at the wikipedia page type in temple of eshman wikipedia page and there's a and then look at don't just read it look at the sources who wrote about this stuff they're called temple boys and this mm -hmm. is in the this is the temple of ashman and it makes you wonder are they baptizing babies in the same way christians later on do this like here's my new here's my new infant please baptize him so we can be saved or like it, it reminds me of that not not only that but it's kind of making me wonder because where do we get this idea that cherubs are little you know chubby babies because that is nowhere in the bible yeah, yeah, and then you have well, you know what I think I think that I might have to do with Cupid. Cupid yeah. has his wings. Cupid's a little angel looking thing. By the Eros, way, here's the man, come on. You gotta you gotta love Eros, man. He's a yeah, cute they, little guy. Latin Cupid, he's a cute Greek little Eros. guy, and he's there and yeah. Yeah, look at oh, and by the way, if you don't if you don't think this was widespread, because he was known as Cupid to the Romans, he was known as Eros to the Greeks, but the 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 Egyptians had Harpo Harpocrates. He's the Egyptian version of Eros. And he looked, he's a cross combination of uh, Horus and Cupid. He's like a little angel guy. Here, I'll, I'll pull it up for you. Hippocrates, angel. I'll show you what it looks like. There's a whole, there's a whole bunch of, uh, look at this, look at this. This is the definition of an angel. I just want to, just tell me I'm wrong. Wait, wait till you see this. Tell me, tell me this is not what an angel looks like. Ready? Look at that. That's not an angel. That's Harpocrates. That's Horus. Gotta love that's him. Son, that's the son of Isis right there. He's got golden wings, baby. Yeah, he's the. That's uh, that's where I think the idea of these little boy angels come from is from him. That, Neil, Neil, gonna blow your mind. That's what they yeah. call Phanes. Yeah, Phanes. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> I, that does blow my mind. You're right. <laughs> it always comes back to that. It always comes yeah. back to that. So the another divine child. It's called the divine child, right? Yeah. Right. So here's another one. Uh, this one's a lot more Egyptian looking, but um, but what I'm getting at was in these temples you find these little babies, and it makes you wonder: are they are they baptizing babies at their births? Like I want to know that. I'm gonna I'm, that's what I want to know. And there's a text, there's a text from the fourth century, or during the reign of Constantine, that says that C Romans from all over the empire were flocking to Lebanon. To go to the temple of Eshbon to get the, to get a holy bath, to get a sacred bath. And this so, is not Christianity. This is not Christianity. This is something totally different. So, oh. Neil, I, I just thought about something. So, is it something that people would probably do when their child was born right away? Probably not. But, like, essentially what I'm thinking is, what's the, like, what, you know about the tradition in Judaism on the eighth day, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering, maybe, like, maybe 
And I don't know. I don't uh, have- no, no, no. I know what you're getting at. That That's a mind-blowing. The eighth day, Ashmon is named the eighth, right? Oil eighth, eighth day. Maybe this is some sort of secret, some sort of medical center. By the way, Ashmon is called the, the Sclepius of Beirut. Every other every other place where Asclepius is worshipped it has a dual um purpose it's all it's like a it's like a it's like an ancient hospital it's where people go to get healed i'm one you could second that for me right yeah it's an it's an ancient sanitarium where they do everything from serious surgery and bone repair to removing of external warts or exactly. to curing oh i saw a case of uh advanced herpes which we don't we typically don't have that because right. we have some antivirals that can help the progression right but well, the they have what i'm getting at oh, was anyway. if this if these if these places if okay if all these neo middle platonist writers like photius and damascus are equating eshman with asclepius and his temple is a place where they're doing ablution oiling healing sacred baths then what don't you think this might be a place where they're doing healing and medical stuff as well maybe this is where people are going to get circumcisions done just throwing that out there eighth day Eshmon is the god of the eighth here's your babies right here your temple boys Baal Shalhem means temple boy I didn't know that till now that's what it, that's actually that's the actual word for it oh Baal no Shalom. No, 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 it isn't. So that that's that must be the name of the temple or something. So it's so Baal, you know. The, oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord. Baal Shalem, Lord. What does that mean, Lord? Uh, Sh- Shalem. So it, it's referencing like Shalem, the 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 god of the dusk. Okay. Um, which is also where the name Yerushalem. Yeah, look, look. Comes from scribed in Phoenician from Eshmon Sanctuary, four hundreds BCE. So what I'm getting at is that this might be an ancient location for. Medical stuff, medical stuff, and then by the way, you get the rod of Asclepius. Oh yeah, and th- th- there's that, some that medical symbol that's still used in 2022. Walk into any hospital, and you will see the rod of Asclepius. So hey, uh, this, uh, Neil, this Neil, uh, Galen did his training at the Asclepian in uh, Pergamum. See, that's where he, that's where he did his medical training, and he was known. Well, he became known all over Rome, yeah. right? But um, he did his training there, and he has a very nice recipe. Again, something you won't believe me, but I'm going to tell you. For it's called the circumcision repair, and you can actually. Oh cut, yeah, I've heard uh, of this. Epispasm. Cut. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. We won't talk about it. No, I didn't say not to. I said I get what you're. Saying. There was a reverse circumcision. People who got circumcised who wanted to not be circumcised, they did a thing on them. But look at this though. Eshmon identified with Asclepius as a result of Hellenic influence over Phoenicia. The earliest evidence of this equation is from Amrit, an acre from the 3rd century BC. This fact is exemplified by the Hellenized names of Awali River, which dubbed Asclepius Fluvius, and Eshmon's temple surrounding. So they were naming this Asclepius. They were naming him Asclepius. The river is sleepless, yeah. Right, that's that's, that, that's where he was at, though. So it's there's all- there's no doubt in my mind that this was a healing sa- center for the ancient uh, Semites. It's also worth mentioning that, and there's speculation on this. Like, I don't want to say that because this isn't this isn't a Jewish tradition. I want to spe- I want to specify. No, no, but, no. Um, but there there is some understanding that maybe the practice of circumcision is like essentially evoking some sort of like serpentine imagery like uh, phallic serpentine imagery and that essentially the removal of the foreskin it it that it it resembles more of a snake that way but if that's the case that could also be a connection to ash moon right can, right, we, right. can, can we get there with the baby that neil dragged in the baby getting washed can we get to the fact that we're also drinking abort aborted fluids and Look, in one of the notes, in one of the notes, it says the front register depicts from left to right. Eros, we were just talking, I didn't even know this. Eros, an unidentified matron, matronly goddess who stands behind Artemis, who is crowning and enthroned Leto. Apollo stands playing a kithara, k- guitar, remember we were talking about? Kithara, guitar. 
next yeah. to Athena. Zeus appears next, enthroned. They're describing the temple. Why do you what? doubt, dude? You doubt all the time. It's Jerusalem. It's where that kid was. Now this right? I know this is Same right outside. Mystery, this bro. is this is right next to Galilee. So if you really, I'm not kidding. Look at here's the map. Can you still see my screen? Uh, I don't know why the I don't know why the dot went away. Okay, can you see my screen over here? The gal, can you see my my mouse right now, guys? Yeah. Okay. This right here is Galilee. This that's the that's the Galilee. That's the Tiberius River. That's the shores of Galilee right there. Here is where this place is at. Right down the street, guys. I'm, for me, for 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 someone to say that there's no way this their culture influenced culture right over here, you're crazy. You're crazy. I don't know, Neil. I I see an I see an invisible dotted line that divides them. It must mean there was no connection. <laughs> All right, you're right. I stand corrected. The invisible lines get you every time. <laughs> there, there's but, a great okay. there's a great falafel stand there too. Next time you. Yeah, Next time you're there. The by the way, Neil is going to Israel. Neil is going to Israel. Days. I got my hat ready. <laughs> I got my tourist hat ready. Let me show you. <laughs> yeah. Israel. I'm so jealous. If I if I went there, I don't think I'd be able to leave. <laughs> it's gonna be a good time. I'm and I'm getting a lot of content for you guys. I'm not kidding. I'm actually gonna be working the most of the time there. Just to get I really I'm not kidding. I want to bring back content and by the way while we're there we're going live every night i got the equipment ready for live streams and everything so we're going live every night me derek and dr tabor every night so make sure you two are in the fucking chat too you better be oh i will i'm going to miss everything else i had planned <laughs> <laughs> oh also just w w one thing because i don't know how long y'all want to go for but w one thing that oh, um, yeah one thing, oh or here we, we can take the super chat okay yeah no, i didn't want to cut you off i just i just didn't see it till now Mandy, thank you for the super chat. Do you think the theory by Julian Jaynes, his book, The Bic Bicameral Mind, has any explanation for why the ancients heard the gods or daemons outside of themselves? Brain halves. Westworld wow. actually kind of covers this topic. It's really interesting. And by the way, Socrates had a personal daemon who he spoke to. And people said that, like, I got the book right here, actually. It's... Uh, this one. It's by Plato, The Last Days of Socrates. And it talks about, and Xenophon has a text about this too, where he was he was talking to himself, but he wasn't talking, he was like looking up like this. Yeah. Oh, what, what about you? What do you think I should do? Um, no, no, I don't know. And everyone's like, what the hell is Socrates doing? He was talking to his personal daemon. That's what that, that's the claim. Like, I, I can't tell you what was going on. All I know is that's what the text says. Socrates had a personal daemon who he would talk to out in daylight in front of people. Man. Wow. And by the way, he was charged for atheism. How is how, what in what world is an atheist sitting there talking to a personal daemon? <laughs> crazy, crazy. Go ahead. Anyone? I don't. I don't know if I, was that. I hope I answered the question sort of right. Mandy, what do you do? What do you do with the satanic folks? in the middle ages and their use of during the black Sabbath of seeing the devil appear as the, they always describe him, you know, is this is the goat, you know, black, big horns, taller than normal. It's got his nice pan legs. Right? Somehow I missed this Damn. one. I just want to, yeah. I'm sorry. Somehow He's, I missed this melody. Thank you so much. I missed this. Don't know how I missed it. Maybe I was looking up the, temple boy thing i just totally missed it but thank you for that but anyways thank you sorry to cut you off just i didn't i don't, I don't like skipping people online that's all this but go back to uh mandy sorry no they just they just say they saw the devil so just like the greeks will talk about the resurrection even rational people like cicero you know talk about the resurrection that is so important right that they view that's the kind of thing that um uh, the Satanists are doing with the devil in their right where they're all drinking from the virgin. Uh, so, yeah, is this is this um, is this something that the bicameral mind has convolutedly created? I don't know what the psychology is. I used to cut up brains in a laboratory all the time. You know what I've heard know, about this? I don't know what the I don't know what the 
I was talking to, about, talking to someone about this, and they said that the right and left brain almost act like two different people communicating between each other. They have different purposes and what they do. Now, I, I, I'm listen. I'm no. Don't listen to me on this subject. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm only going off like some things I've heard from people say. But if that's true, that's kind of interesting. It's like you have two personalities, and like one's doing one thing, one's doing another, and they're and they're like, oh, we got, they're like talking to each other. You know what I mean? Like that's that's an interesting concept. You know how we found, we discovered that fact, Neil. We discovered that fact from the bridge, from the Pontifex, between the two sides of the brain. Because dudes in World War II who had shrapnel go through and cut. There was a famous case of a guy who had that cut between his left side and right side, could no longer communicate. It's called a corpus callosum, bro. And right. anyway, um, that's how you find out that stuff. Now, is it the bike? Is it the mind processing that allows you to hear the voices? You could go back, Mandy, and you could go back to the to the folks doing the Ellicinian mysteries. In being there, you might see what's going on, and you might you might find that there's some magic there that can't be explained by uh, right and left side brain. Um, yeah. Um, although I would love to see your paper. On, you know what we need to do, Mandy? We need to get a couple of devotees, and we need. To, I've got a great microtome. We could freeze their brains, take slices of them, and I have some osmium tetroxide. We could stain them for whatever we wanted to totally do a workup of their brain chemistry and see what it is, you know, that's causing it. Great question, by the way, Mandy. I would, that's, and that'd be an interesting, uh, uh, science project right there. Whoa. Um, so, but I, look at this, look at this talisman. I just pulled up. I'm really interested in the left side. Okay. What? Has, no, that's the Demiurge. There's that's Eros on the left or Harpocrates. If you, if it's in Egypt. And then in the middle, what is, what the hell is that in the middle? I think that's Ashura. That's what I'm saying. It looks like the maybe the the great Ma Sophia, maybe Thanes. Why is she bigger than the Demiurge, though? Well, not not only that, but here I want to point out a few things. So first of all, and then you got the seven stars in, inside of the serpent. Ha! Wait, that's, what? That's oh, seven oh, stars. Yeah, but, that but looks yeah, like it, the Ouroboros right yeah. there. The, yeah, that's a symbol wow. of the universe right there. That's outside of her cave. It's outside of her cave. If this is real, I haven't seen this one, this piece. Doesn't mean they didn't discover it. I didn't see it. But I haven't seen this one. But if it's real, it's a direct association with a cult then of Demogorgon. So, yeah, with the woman in the cave. That Roboros is the seal that's on the outside of her cave. Oh, I'm where, sorry. I'm where, sorry. Is the the where, where is the goddess? Where is the goddess? Where is she of our of our audience is sitting here? How do we bring her back? Yellow Psych just said Hecate. How do yeah. we bring her back, audience? I'm addressing you. Does anybody ever address the audience? Can we try this? Audience, how do we bring her back? Lady Babylon, how do we do it? What is the story of the explorer? <laughs> By the way, Hecate is basically the another like, <laughs> side of Lucifer. She's Lucifer. another side of what? She's Lucifer. She's the light bringer. Oh yeah. Speaking of that, something that I um, I recently brought up uh, with y'all in like uh, our text chat um, that I found really interesting is that so you have this idea that the Lucifer or sorry that the you know dawn of the or uh, star of the morning is um, you know th that that's associated with like good stuff, but then the idea that that gets associated with the devil is likely a result of um, there there was an ancient Near Eastern god named Azizos or um, from the root like Azaz which is also in Azazel. And so ba basically you have this one God that is probably associated with goats because the word Ez means goat. Um, and so Azaz means like rugged, but there's just this general connection. And that th you have two, two goats, one is sent or one is sacrificed to, you know, to Yahweh and the other is um, sacrificed to Azazel. But the thing is that, um, so Azizos at one point was known as the morning star and so, like, I don't know, it's interesting there. But the um, the other thing, uh, could we just bring up the um, that coin again real quick? Because there's something I wanted to point out. So if you, if you look at it, so um, you have, um, what it is, so you have, you know, in the middle, you have, like, a feminine character. On the right, you have the Demiurge. And on the left, you have essentially the save, like, like the, um, was it like the save, or the son of the, um, 
Wait, it's under the morning, right? Or well, she's she's the loose. She's the light bringer. But but he's the son of the morning, right? Like, she, well, I guess he would be. Well, he he's Horus. Oh, he, well, he looks a little young to be out by himself. Like that's that. Horus. That's Harpocrates. But anyway, so the, but the, he's the, also Eros too. So, son of the morning would be Lucifer. But that he, look, he looks he looks too male. young. Too young to be out by himself. How old do you think that boy is? That's that little. That's little. Uh, well, actually, Eros doesn't age. Yeah. Okay. So like, he could be thousands of years old for all. I mean, that's what it, I mean. Okay. Technically, that's what he is. But, yeah. But anyway, okay. but, but anyway my, my point. I, if you could bring it back up again. Sorry. Yeah. Um. So, um, if you look, how many arms does she have? I thought there. Were, okay, it looks like six, but I thought there might have been seven. No. So there's six, and then she has a head. And so, like does that, she always have six. Oh, she does always have six arms, doesn't she? She has what? three heads, just like the triform yeah. Hecate does. Oh wow! Oh, okay. This is going to blow your mind. So, with um, so the menorah is believed to like essentially represent or like embody like the um the spirit of the Shekhinah. Yeah. And so you have and it's light too. It's light too. That's even yeah. crazier. Yeah. And, so you have, um, you know, three on each side, but then in the middle, you know, you have the, the stock, but it's kind of like this understanding that like a shin itself is three. So it's almost like you have three, 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 but, um, why does the one have nine? That's a, that's not a real well, one. So, no, no. So th this is actually really interesting. I found, um, uh, uh, I'll, basically there, there's this one thing where it's saying that when you make or like you should not make any menorah with seven branches because it's like because it's so holy and it's associated with a temple the idea really? is that you can make it with five with uh with six or with eight but the whole point is that you don't want to do it with seven because like it, it's essentially the equivalent of like not like idolatry but it's kind of like sacrilege like who are you to think that you can have a seven yeah 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 no, i get that like I see, I'm looking at one right now inside one of these temples. It's got seven, but it's in a temple. It's in a, it's actually in a synagogue or a temple, whatever they call it. And for some reason, I can't download this now too. Huh. But but yeah, so the the ones with eight, so like four on each side, and then one in the middle, so like a total of nine. Yeah, that's used for Hanukkah. And um, interestingly enough, there's there's even this one thing where it talks about when you make a menorah, don't make it out of wood like the Hasmoneans did, which is really interesting because the Hasmoneans. Well, Sorry, yeah. No, I just said what. So the Hasmoneans were Hellenists, but I wonder if maybe part of that Hellenism was that they were also Yo. like Look essentially. At this. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, uh, basically, let's see. Um, here, let me find this real quick. Is the thing can I, can I the Maccabees made a deal with the Romans? The Maccabees, the Maccabees made a, made a deal with the Romans to to have a treatise on and and work and work against the Greeks and the Seleucids. Oh yeah, that's the seven one right there. Can I just say that Yellow Psych um, has a great point here? Hecate is no joke. All these little urban outfitter Wiccans have no idea. Yeah, I. <laughs> I love by that. Way, by the way, Yellow Psych, thank you for that super chat. I was about to get to it, but I just was letting uh, Ariel finish his point. Go ahead, Ariel, though. All right. So yeah, I can't find the specific thing about the menorah, but the one thing I did want to bring up is we're talking about you know the Temple Boy and essentially this idea of. Because if you look at the way that it describes um, David, you know, that he's ru um, ruddy, uh, you know, ruddy and uh, I, I forget exactly how it describes him, but basically beautiful, ruddy, like, um, you, you know, like that um, essentially describing him as beautiful. And one thing that I think is kind of interesting is that, you know, if you look at the description of like, you know, the, with Astarte and Ashmoon or, um, or Adonis that, you know, she falls in love with him because of his beauty. Um, and so I was looking at Song of Songs and uh, I have it pulled it up right now. I have it pulled up right now. So, um, so in this part, this is like the, the female lover, which again, it, whether it's talking about a human or a God, that's, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but so how fair is your beloved better than another? Oh, fairest of women. How is your beloved better than another that you adjure us? So, um, oh, it also, no. So it says, or what sort of beloved is your beloved? But so here, so she responds, my beloved is clear skinned and ruddy. And again, Sach doesn't necessarily mean clear skinned. It just means like bright and ruddy. So it could be like bright eyed and ruddy, um, which is another way that's described. 
preeminent among 10,000. Um, his head is finest gold. His locks are curled and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by, um, by water courses bathed in milk, set by a brimming pool. Um, so like you have this, essentially this imagery of, um, you, you know, the chosen one in this case, David, well, or sorry, this isn't specifically referring to David, but the, the use of, um, well, f first of all, it's also Dodi, which is, um, like a cognate with David. Uh, it's spelled the same, like it would be Davidi. Um, like, uh, if you spell it differently, it could be my David, but I, I doubt that's the case. Sure. Um, what's interesting though, is like how it says, um, uh, like clear and ruddy. That's also how David's described. But, um, one thing that I think is really interesting with that is that um, you were asking before about, you know, is there this, uh, I, I forget exactly how Amun phrased it, but like, you know, do you have this in the Bible with the, um, essentially like the, um, you, you know, the woman as part of this and you do, but it's also saying that nothing improper happened between them. So here it says, um, uh, is this, uh, uh, here I, I have it pulled up. What? Um, right. So, uh, now David was old, advanced in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he could not become warm. So his servants <coughs> said to him, let, let, there, oh, let there be sought for my lord, the king, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king and be his attendant. But what's interesting here, I noticed this root attendant, it's, um, uh, oh wait, it's not used here, it's, it's below, um, but I'll, I'll show you. Um, the word for attendant or servant is also very similar to Asherah. The, the root is Shara or Sharet. But um, so, so his servant said to him, let there be sought for my lord, the king, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king and let, uh, let be his attendant and let her lie in thy bosom that my lord, the king, may, may become warm. Um, <laughs> and the word here... I'll get you warm. Oh, wow. The word Cham, to be hot, to become warm, to grow warm of passion, to become aroused or inflame oneself. So like it, it, it translates it as, oh, um, l later it says that, you know, there's nothing improper, but it's also within it. Like if you read it, just the Hebrew, you could actually see that this is saying that he became inflamed with her, but that's not how it gets translated. So they hey, saw what her. David, what David did with that virgin when they got chest to chest was, you don't have to be dirty about it. Anybody can, I've seen Roman matrons do that with boys. You know what I mean? Come on. Yellow Sykes yeah. says, weren't you talking about hairy legs before? Doesn't David's girlfriend have hairy legs? And he peeks at them through the reflection of the floor. <laughs> I, I, don't I, know. I have no idea what he's talking about, but it's funny. Yeah, I'd like a source for that. That'd be interesting. But I have no knowledge of this. Whoever's watching from the authorities, I have no knowledge of such things. You know what's you know what we don't know what we should do. Now maybe not right now because I gotta go soon, but it's almost been two hours. I, I, I gotta go too, and I wanna yeah. I have one question I want to ask. Okay. Oh and now okay. Hey uh, guys, guys, from everything that we've looked at today, I'm addressing the audience who's sitting there kindly giving us their time. Um and thank you, Yellow Psych, for the super chats and Mandy as well, and everyone else, but those two had a couple of them, so I just want to thank them as well. But everybody who had a super chat, Yellow Psych, Mandy, um, uh, who else was it? It was Mandy again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks you already. To um, the audience. To yeah, the everybody audience. who super chatted. I, I just don't want to single two people out and then not thank everyone else. But I can't see them all right now. Um, Melody Joy and there's a couple other people there who super chatted. Thank you guys all for the super chats. I appreciate those. Okay. One one question to you, to the audience assembled. Um, the plan in the evangelical community is for this apocalypse to proceed. It has been that way yeah. for at least 2,000 years. You could argue with the Orphic stuff. It's been that way like 3,000 years. Um, but uh, is your... Is anybody else here ready to go for the apocalypse? I mean, should we should we dive in? Just please reach out, reach out, and tell, put a comment now and, and tell me. Do you want do you want the apocalypse? Is this something Neil should be should be thinking about? Should we look at the apocalypse? Is it time? I think there's been a lot of failed apocalypses, enough to say that if it's gonna happen, 
it's going to be from our own doing from like climate change or something. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe, or you know what? Maybe an asteroid does come along because there are, there are some cases where they can come out of detection. Like scientists don't have a whole entire sky mapped out where they can see things from like 10 years away. Like if it's going to come, it's going to come and it could be pretty soon. That's always a thought too. Other than that though, the Christians ideas of this end times is just kind of bunk. And that's just, that's, that's, that's a fact. They don't got, they don't got, they don't, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know. Um, oh, can, we, um, can, I, can I just finish that? Because there's like one more line. Yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, so, um, so they, they sought for a fair maiden throughout all the territory of Israel and found Avishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. And the maiden was very fair and she attended the king. But this word for attended, um, Vitishartehu, it's there, there's a possible connection with Asherah there, but um, and she attended the king and ministered to her, or no, so ministered is the one that translates as that, but um, but see, the Hamelech lo yada'a, and the king did not know her, so it literally you could just interpret this as they didn't have intercourse, but that's not to say that they weren't intimate, sure. No, I get that, that makes sense. The exchange of fluids is always an option. I noticed that air, air without... and that's when the, and that's when you had the conception of the birth and they will say especially the Romans did this if there's a marriage and the consummation occurs and this is like okay yeah well, they actually did it then the birth starts then they they say this for example I'm going to do a whole episode on this Augustus was born on December 25th look at you can say I'm crazy all you want but check this out if you go to the text, Suetonius, it says he's a Capricorn, but it says he's born on uh, September 23rd. That's 10 months away. Well, Suetonius also says that his Atia was pregnant for 10 months. She said that he, she was conceived 10 months before, and he's a Capricorn. Capricorn starts on December 22nd. If you go back 10 months from September 23rd, Excluding the two days from February, because February is a bad luck month to the Romans. We even still today have February only 28 days. You get to December 25th on the nose. He's a Capricorn, bro. And he's not even born in that month. He's born in September. Because they had their star signs for when you were conceived. That's crazy, though. So Neil's looking for a savior and Ariel's looking for a maiden who <laughs> brings healing. And I'm wondering if we should be looking for the apocalypse. I think it's worth, don't you, come on, guys. Don't you think it's worth looking into one last time? Let's put yeah. this thing to rest or let's issue in the apocalypse. The real apocalypse, not the apocalypse that people think is the end of the world because, you know, what's it actually mean? It means revealing. It means revelation, yeah. And with that, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you.